The Spirit of God has been burdening my heart to make a full-length cassette on the issues of the day, and so I will be dealing with drugs, AIDS, pornography, immorality, and all the things that are going on in America presently. And all of this ties in with Bible prophecy and the coming again of the Lord Jesus Christ. The first message, then, will deal with drugs. Ted Koppel recently said, Drug abuse in America today is a national crisis. It long ago reached epidemic proportions. And for all the public service announcements on television, all the sensational stories involving massive drug busts, anonymous children, and world-famous stars of the entertainment world who got hooked, for all of that, the problem keeps getting worse. Jed Duvall says, There may be as much as 130 tons of cocaine coming in every year, 75% of it from one foreign country, Colombia. Marijuana comes chiefly from Colombia, Mexico, and from the USA, homegrown. The marijuana smoked in one year weighs more than 9,000 tons. Nearly half the six tons of heroin consumed in the U.S. starts out in Pakistan, Afghanistan, or Iran. Seizures by federal agents have risen rapidly. The amounts of heroin are measured in the hundreds of millions of dollars, but the cocaine supply, just that which has been captured, is counted in the billions of dollars. In 1979, authorities intercepted 1,400 pounds of cocaine. In 1984, they confiscated 27,500 pounds, nearly 14 tons of cocaine. With seizures up, the supply is lower, so the price should go higher, but it doesn't. So much cocaine is still available that what used to cost $60 on the street now sells for $30 or less, and it's everywhere. 20 to 25 million Americans have tried cocaine. Four to five million of them use it once a month. Some 30 million smoke marijuana occasionally or often. There are, it is estimated, this is sad, a half million Americans addicted just to one narcotic, heroin. Know what it's doing? We could talk about our basketball players, football players, baseball players, sportsmen, and all the other professions, and how it kills m young men like Bias. But let me tell you the sad story of one drug abuser. Her name, Diane Linkletter. This beautiful, talented 20-year-old daughter of famous radio and television personality Art Linkletter, in a depressed, panic-filled, suicidal frame of mind, resulting from an LSD experiment. That's mild now compared to others. Committed suicide by leaping to her death from her sixth floor apartment in Los Angeles. Her father immediately has become a champion in the anti-drug crusade. Now, why was he so concerned? Using the language of narcotic users, try to get the picture. Visualize dopers cowering in a corner waiting to inject, sniff, or swallow. In the group are meth heads, junkies, potheads, speed freaks, acid heads, hypes, pills heads, cokies, cube heads, and hop heads. They pop, snort, or drop yellow jackets, acid, snow, purple hearts, barbs, weed, bounding powder, smack, Mary Jane, red devils, blue angels, joints, horse, Acapulco Gold, Dynamite, Speedball, Happy Dust, Mess, Goofballs, Rainbows, Hearts, Bombita, Uppers, 25, Jolly Beans, Skag, Dollies, Speed. It goes on and on. Dexies, Reefers, Blue Velvet, Bennies. See, we're not just talking about marijuana, cooking. we're talking about the multiplicity of narcotics to destroy lives. These same dopers speak of bags, roaches, bindles, sleigh rides, Fixes, tracks, blanks, decks, blasts, flashes, being strung out. They have an enormous fear of narcs, stoolies, an OD, the fuzz, bummers, coming down, not having bread or money for a dealer, a crash, getting a dummy, cold turkey, freakouts, not being able to score, the cop out, flipping, lemonade, and being busted by the man when dirty. As you can easily see, it's a bad, bad scene. What's caused this alarming escalation of narcotics use, including alcohol? By the way, a booklet published by the federal government lists 
alcohol as a narcotic. Some of you folks criticizing younger people for other drugs are constantly imbibing in alcoholic beverages. And a booklet, another one published by the federal government, lists the following factors as contributing to the great turn on in our day. One, the widespread belief that medicines can magically solve problems. Two, the numbers of young people who are dissatisfied or disillusioned or who have lost faith in the prevailing social system. Three, the tendency of persons with psychological problems to seek easy solutions with chemicals. Four, the easy access to drugs. Five, the development of an affluent society that can afford drugs. Six, the statements of proselytizers who proclaim the goodness of drugs. Such a widespread usage of drugs as exists in America and throughout the world today cannot help but bring its own destruction. And I'm going to preach and preach hard because my heart's broken at the thousands and tens of thousands who are dying and the hundreds of thousands whose lives are being ruined. So let me speak out and let me tell you what the Word of God says. You're in trouble with God Almighty. And the book of Revelation clearly depicts the time in which we're living and which is immediately ahead of us. After the rapture of the true church, when all have received Jesus Christ as personal Savior, are translated to be with Him, with Christ. That's after we're gone now. There will break out on this earth a period of such turmoil that is aptly called the tribulation. Revelation 9, 21 gives the following description of the people who will then be living on earth. It says, Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their fornication, nor of their sorceries, nor of their thefts. In the books of the Old Testament and in the historical book of the New Testament, that's the book of Acts, the term sorcery always means witchcraft or magic. However, the last five occurrences of this word in the New Testament mean drug addiction. In Revelation 9.21, the original Greek root word is pharmakia, P-H-A-R-M-A-K-E-I-A. When it is transliterated into English, we have pharmacy or <laughs> drugstore. Imagine. But the literal meaning of the Greek is enchantment with drugs. Therefore, the description of the condition upon earth during the tribulation period after the church is gone, after the Lord has come for his own, is that men repent not of their enchantment with drugs. A little later in the book of Revelation, the final chapters, we have before our eyes something graphically described. And I quote from chapter 18, beginning with verse 21. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. This verse depicts the continuation of riots and burnings which are becoming an increasingly dreadful part of the days in which we live. And it's going to get worse according to this verse. Because verse 22 states, And the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. And no craftsman of whatsoever crafty be shall be found any more at all in thee. Think of it. Entertainment ceases in this laugh-a-minute commercial empire. All music and hilarity is forever and forever silenced. The craftsmen, including tool and die makers, auto mechanics, and machinists are out of business as all production is halted. In Babylon, once the international center of commerce, verse 23, and the light of the candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee, for thy merchants were the great men of the earth, and by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. Hear this, lights are extinguished, possibly through energy deficiency. Marriages cease as heartbreak inundates and floods the land. There's no time for mirth, joy, love, or romanticism. Here again, the Greek word is phonomachia, and the statement is that by enchantment with drugs, all nations are deceived. What a day is coming upon planet Earth. In the next occurrence of the word translated sorcerers, 
there is a change in meaning. It is found in Revelation 21.8, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in a lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Here the Greek root word is pharmakos, P-H-A-R-M-A-K-E-U-S, and literally means the enchanter with drugs or the pusher or seller of drugs. The text plainly declares that eight distinct groups of people will never, please get this, your soul depends on it, they shall never get into heaven. Yea, each one of these eight groups will go into the lake of fire, which is a description of what the Bible calls eternal hell. One of these groups is those who are enchanters with drugs. <sighs> What a solemn warning against having any part in this abominable, rotten, filthy, dirty, stinking traffic. There is but one more reference to sorceries in this last book of the Bible. It is almost the same as given in Revelation 21.8, but has a still deeper meaning. Revelation 22.15 states, For without or outside of heaven are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers, and murderers, and idolaters, and whosoever loveth, and maketh a lie. Here the word is again, Fatimakos, and definitely includes both the pushers and users. Are you one of them? The fact that they are kept out of heaven is further clarified by 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Just as certainly as no drunkard, remember that's a form of drug addiction according to the United States government, no drunkard, just as certainly as no drunkard shall inherit the kingdom of God, so no drug addict or pusher, shall defile the streets and the people on heaven's streets. Another word with the same meaning is found in Galatians 5, verses 19 to 21. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, Envings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, then he adds, and such like. Seventeen sins and a few more like them, of which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not, oh God help us, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. The word here is translated in our English Bible as witchcraft plus drunkenness, so we have two words in this listing of 17 having to do with narcotics. But here we take for a moment the word witchcraft. It's the same word that we've used before, Fatimakaya, in the book of Revelation. It's number six in a listing of 17 kinds of sinners who shall not Oh, get rid of that rotten drug habit. It'll destroy your body and your soul, for they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. The Bible is explicitly clear in its teachings that the drug user and the drug pusher are both excluded from God's heaven. Oh, what can be done for the one who finds himself enmeshed in this terrible traffic? Is there no hope of escape from the clutches of this binding habit? Let me tell you, the Lord Jesus Christ came into the world for one express purpose, that he might destroy the works of the devil, 1 John 3, 8. By his death upon the cross, Jesus has broken the grip of Satan. Amen. So when any guilty sinner calls upon Christ for help and salvation, Christ immediately frees that person from the shackles of sin which have bound him. There is no limit to the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. But 
How does one apply this power for his own needs? The answer to this question is so simple that many fail to understand it. It comes by receiving Christ. Ah, as many as received him, to them give he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. John 1.12 Yes, the power which is released when one receives Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior is the power to become a son of God and then to be set free. For the blood of Jesus Christ applied to the one who calls on the name of the Lord produces victory. That's why 1 Corinthians 15, 57 states, Thanks be unto God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. In addition, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 declares, If any man or woman be in Christ, he or she is a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Whether you are a victim of drugs or drunkenness or any other vice, the Bible clearly explains that Jesus Christ is the way of deliverance. Would you take special note of John 8, 34? Jesus said to the Pharisees, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. But if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free. Indeed. <laughs> Verse 36. The very fact that you have chosen and continue to choose sin, whether you admit it or not, is evidence of the fact that you are a slave to sin. Some have sufficient willpower to maybe break one habit, but are bound by their vices. But when an individual receives Christ, the Savior imparts His power, and that person is free indeed. You may be steeped in drug addiction or alcoholism, God loves you. Oh, we've preached some strong texts today from the Bible, wherein God condemns this sin and says that those who remain in these sins will be lost. There's no doubt about that. We can't deny God's Word. But we have hundreds and hundreds of verses telling us that God loves sinners. He doesn't love their sin, but He loves them. That's why he came. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let me give you a few more verses where we prove that God loves you and he did everything possible to save you and will save you and will set you free right now. John 1 29, John the Baptist looked at Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sin of the world. Romans 1.16, Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, the good news about Christ, for it is the power of God. Dynamite is the literal Greek word. It's the dynamite of God unto salvation. It'll bless you free from your sin. And to whom is this promise given? To all who believe. You say, oh, there's no hope. God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8. No hope. Christ in you, the hope, the guarantee of glory. Heaven, he can set you free, deliver you today. He's able to save to the uttermost. Hebrews 7, 25. No one's ever gone beyond God's reach. Neither of you. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree. Who sins? Ours. 1 Peter 2.24 And that's why when 
you or I or any member of the human race steeped in the vilest of sins comes to the foot of the cross and looks at that uplifted Jesus shedding his blood and says, I believe that blood can save me. Lord Jesus, thank you for shedding your blood for the remission of my sins. Thank you for shedding your blood to deliver me from alcoholism, to deliver me from drugs, to deliver me from homosexuality, to deliver me from immorality, to deliver me from every vice known to man. Name yours to God right now if you do and you mean it, I can promise you under authority, 1 John 1, 7, that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. And so they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the blood of Jesus Christ. Revelation 12, 11. Pray this prayer with me. Father, I'm a sinner. I'm steeped. in the dregs of the world's vices. Set me free now. I trust in the blood of Jesus. I claim the blood of Jesus for my salvation. Now wash away my sin and just set me free. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. I pray it in your name. Amen. Message number two, herpes and AIDS. Did you know that the present sexual rage with its accompanying venereal disease was prophesied in the Bible centuries ago? Jesus, in describing the world's condition at the time of his return to earth, said that iniquity would abound, Matthew 24, 12. He also stated that closing time would be similar to Noah's era or day, verse 37. At that time, every imagination of the thoughts of men's hearts was only evil continually. Genesis 6, 5. Also, all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Verse 12. As a result, judgment came. Certainly, immorality inundates America, and it has been pushed to unbelievable dimensions. In the meantime, millions are being judged, not by a flood like Noah's contemporaries experienced, but by a vile, loathsome thing called venereal disease, and it manifests itself in many forms, such as syphilis, gonorrhea, herpes, and AIDS. The devastating outbreak of these venereal diseases have already infected millions of victims and will sweep to epidemic proportions, affecting and infecting 50 million Americans in the near future. And once one has had herpes or AIDS, he has it for life. Then the pain and sores and death certificates will be a permanent gift from a friendly sexual donor. So beware that one night fling may sting for time and eternity. What's caused this dilemma? Well, immorality brought on sexual permissiveness, and millions of Americans became involved as swingers. Recognize the term? They thought they were getting away with the playboy philosophy that sex is fun, and if it feels good, do it. Now they're paying the price, and it doesn't feel good anymore. And I'll tell you why. No one but no one can break God's holy commandments and get away with it forever. God said in Exodus chapter 20, verse 14, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Instead of listening, men mock God and God's prophets who proclaim such truths as puritanical simpletons. Well, God only allows mankind to laugh so long, and then his promise recorded in Job 4, 8 becomes reality. They that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. Again, be not deceived. God is not mocked or fooled. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Galatians 6, 7. Neighbor, sin is destructive. Quit fooling yourself. Cursing destroys speech. Lying destroys credibility. Greed destroys happiness. Tobacco destroys lungs. Booze destroys decency. Pornography destroys the mind. And sexual promiscuity destroys the body and 
So, wake up before it's too late. Soon you may be carrying a painful and humiliating form of VD simply because you followed the penthouse philosophy of life. In this light, isn't it strange that even pornography writers and X-rated movie makers lament that this terrible pestilence may undo the sexual revelation? Now, wouldn't that be something? The writers in Time magazine say that the sexual plague is altering sexual rights in America, changing courtship patterns, sending thousands of sufferers spinning into months of depression and self-exile and then death. And it's also delivering a numbing blow to the one-night stand. They conclude that venereal diseases may be ushering a reluctant, grudging chastity back in the fashion. It's painful indeed for whirlings to have to admit that Bible-believing Christians may have, after all, been right about the dangers and the wages of sin. A New York therapist states, people are beginning to realize that romance is what relationships are all about. They're disillusioned with free sex and terrified of getting herpes or AIDS and having it forever and then dying. Prostitutes brag about how many men they've infected. In Atlantic City, one harlot laughed as she exclaimed, I bet me and my sister must have given herpes to 1,000 guys. The person who picks up the disease from an unholy relationship suddenly finds himself blasted with two disasters, the revealing of his unfaithfulness and a lifelong disease as a memento of the event. John Leo in the Time Magazine article writes many people who contract herpes go through stages similar to those of mourning for the dead. Shock, emotional numbing, isolation and loneliness, sometimes serious depression and then impotence. Exact results of one mourning for the dead. And this all caused, perhaps because of a night of a sin. Recently, on the medicine page of Newsweek magazine, doctors told of the misery of herpes, calling it a virus of love, an insidious VD that feels like a soldering iron against the skin. They describe the sores, blisters, fever, muscle aches, and swollen lymph glands. The editor of Time magazine writes, on rare occasions herpes in the trigeminal ganglia will journey to the brain, where it causes a generally fatal form of encephalitis or in about a half million cases per year, it will journey to the eye and can seriously damage vision if left untreated. Or it may travel to the spinal cord, causing a mild form of meningitis. Herpes is lethal in up to 60% of infected newborns. For surviving babies, there is a 50% risk of blindness or brain damage. So the calamity of herpes is great indeed. But wait. AIDS destroys the immune system and produces certain death. Tens of thousands will follow Ruck Hudson to the grave soon. Hundreds of thousands within the next 10 years. Sin always has its payday. The wages may be delayed, but are always paid, either in this life or in the life to come. Is it any wonder that God says in Numbers 32, 23, be sure your sin will find you out? Someone listening to me now may be ridiculing what I'm saying. I expect that. God says fools make a mockery of sin, Proverbs 14, 9, but wait, your day is coming, and perhaps sooner than you expect, because the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23, and the way of the ungodly shall perish, Psalm 1, 6. Solomon of Old Testament fame learned that one cannot play with sin and not be burned. He said in Proverbs 5, verses 3 to 13, The lips of a strange woman drop as in honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword, 
Find that her feet go down to death, her steps take hold on hell. Therefore remove your way far from her, and come not near the door of her house, lest you give your honor unto others, and your years unto the cruel. Lest strangers be filled with your wealth, and your labors be in the house of a stranger, and you mourn at last, when your flesh and your body are consumed. And that's not just talking to those who have heterosexual illicit affairs, but to homosexuals too. When your flesh and your body are consumed, wow, then you'll say, Oh, how I hated instruction, and my heart despised reproof. I have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined my ear to them that instructed me. The wicked laugh at the old-fashioned idea of a man being faithful to his own wife and vice versa. But God says that men are to drink waters out of their own sister, and they are to rejoice with the wife of their youth. Yes, they are to let her satisfy them at all times and be ravished always with her love. Proverbs 5, verses 15, 18, and 19. Why? Because Hebrews 13, 4 states, Marriage is honorable and all, and the bed in marriage undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, those who practice sex sin without a marriage license, I'm talking to you folks who are living together not married. God will judge. Judge with syphilis, gonorrhea, herpes, AIDS, and finally, everlasting loss. Dr. Hugh Pyle states, the sin of lust and adultery may end up in embarrassment, shame, sorrow, pain or the physical misery of having herpes, the scarlet monster. Syphilis and gonorrhea, if untreated, may do more damage than herpes. But the sudden upsurge in incurability of herpes has become for many a catastrophe of great magnitude. Lust-loving libertines in the 20th century are going to have to live with their sores and misery as an everlasting reminder that they can't do wrong and escape. Presently, everyone is alarmed. Women are furiously spraying their bathrooms with Lysol. Others are lecturing their husbands on the virtues of chastity. Men are frantically trying to find a way of explaining why they are blighted with sores and fever. Wild suggestions fill the air. None of them curing herpes or AIDS. People are trying seaweed applications, earwax, snake venom, baking soda, bleach, yogurt, and carburetor fluid in an effort to kill a germ. God help us. Yet the bug lives on. A Washington doctor states everything from the full moon to poultices has met with failure. Some are saying that they're swearing off a of sex. People feel that they are now damaged goods, that no one will ever want them, ever. People looking askance at one another, wondering who among their friends or prospective dates has the scarlet monster, has herpes or AIDS that could kill them. While there surely must be a great number of the bar room, dance hall, rock concert, juke joint, orgy crowd with herpes and AIDS, it's significant that it has also hit the nice, healthy, educated, clean-cut people, so-called, of the middle and upper classes. The truth of the matter is that sin is a terrible virus in every human heart, and when sinners indulge in forbidden fruit, they reap the consequences no matter what position they hold in society. The only consolation may be that many who formerly considered sin as a joke now know the filthiness of playing around with debauchery and evil. Husbands realize that the risk is too great in extramarital flings and try harder to find happiness with the wife God gave them. Loose women may also realize that the afternoon fling they learn from these filthy soap operas is not worth a lifetime of sores and viruses. Homosexuals realize that the rapid destruction and then death of the body is not worth the lifestyle they're pursuing. Yes, decency may again become the in thing. The fear of judgment may bring the prolific to their senses and even to God. One pornographer cried, it just may be that there's a God in heaven who is finally carving out his pound of flesh. We shall see. 
I personally believe that today's description of lust, lewdness, and licentiousness indicates that Christ's return is at hand. Why Revelation 9.21 describes earth's inhabitants prior to Christ's appearance or return to earth when he comes to butchery reigns as the immoral refuse to repent of their fornication or continuous episodes of sex sin and perversion. The sign is with us. Jesus is coming soon. Be ready. And if you want to pray that prayer, turn back to the end of the preceding message on drugs and listen to it again and then ask Jesus Christ to save you, washing his blood. If you're away from God and God has spoken to you through both of these messages, repent, change your mind, turn to the Lord. His coming is so near. Every one of these things, drugs, herpes, AIDS, is prophesied in the Bible just before the Lord returns. Be ready. Be ready. Message number three, the blight of pornography. In Matthew 24, 37, Jesus said, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. In order to comprehend what Christ meant in this text, one must consider Genesis chapter 6, verses 1, 2, and 5, which depict Noah's era of time. I quote, And it came to pass when men began to multiply in the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, what was the root of the sexual problems in Noah's day? Simply stated, lustful eyes. You see, sin begins in the eye of the beholder. That's why God said, Whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Matthew 5, 28. Second Peter 2, 14 declares they have eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin. So you see, a longing look often leads to lust. And when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. James 1, 15. This is why 1 John 2, verses 15 to 17 warn, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world, and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Because of the damage lust does to one's body and soul, Christians are to abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, 1 Peter 2.11. We are to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof, Romans 13.14. We are to walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lusts of the flesh, Galatians 5.16. Obviously, then, Christians should battle pornographic filth with all the vim, vigor, and vitality and strength they have, for it is dehumanizing and soul-destroying. Recent congressional hearings have shown that the absence of specific federal legislation is permitting the mushrooming of an unsavory commerce that exploits an estimated 500,000 or more children as young as two or three years of age. The problem, as the Congress has learned, is staggering. Los Angeles police estimate that adults sexually exploit over 30,000 children under 17 last year and photographed many of them in the sex act and that's only in one city in America. In Houston, police arrested Roy Ames after finding a warehouse full of pornography including 15,000 color slides of boys in homosexual acts. In congressional testimony, the Odyssey Institute of New York noted that the Crossroads store on New York's Times Square carried lollitots a magazine showing girls 8 to 14 years of age, nude and involved. A film pictured an alleged father engaging in sex with his four-year-old daughter. Nineteen other films involved children and sixteen involved incest. Dr. Jensen Gerber, founder of 
Odyssey Institute states that such inappropriate sexuality is highly destructive to children. It leads them to join the deviant population of drug addicts, prostitutes, criminals, and pre-adult parents. This degradation of children scars them for life. It must stop and soon. Unfortunately, the penalties for the production and distribution of child pornography are minor, no more than mere wrist slapping. In fact, only six states have laws prohibiting obscene performances by minors. Now, over 100 congressmen are pressing for stiff remedial legislation. The proposed plan would make sexual abuse of children a felony punishable by 20 years in prison or a $50,000 fine or both. Praise God! You've been reading a lot about this in the papers lately. Those opposing these laws, civil libertarians, cry out that child pornography is protected under free speech. Oh, these lust-ridden leeches are the vermin of society. Their consciences are warped and defiled. Ephesians 4.19 describes them. They, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness, immorality, and impurity with greediness. They can't get enough. Is there any hope? Yes. If the laws of the land cannot stop them, the holy laws of God meted out to the judgment they will. Then they'll pay for every little child they ruin. Romans 1.18 states, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. They're worthy of death, verse 32. This includes the second death, the lake of fire, Revelation 21.8. Meanwhile, are we to sit back and do nothing? Some say the best way to deal with pornography is to let it run its course. But must we tolerate everything, no matter how depraved, how sick? The public's answer is, we will fight. Because we have the right to rear decent children in a decent society, and children and not decent adults also have a right to a decent society. Now, since morality is the essence of God's Ten Commandments, as well as the entire teaching of the Holy Bible, Christians should be crusaders in the battle against the world, the flesh, and the devil. Paul cries out in Ephesians 6, 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. How sad to see many pornographic bookstores within a few doors of gospel-preaching churches. Does Reverend Milk Toast do anything about it? No, he wants peace with the world and armistice with iniquity. This is contrary to the Almighty God in Isaiah 58, 1 demands that his servants cry aloud, spare not, Lift up your voices, he says, like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression. Yes, ministers are to preach the word, not just little soothing nuggets of truth, but the condemnatory passages as well that reprove, rebuke, and exhort, 2 Timothy 4, 2. However, many clergymen do not have enough backbone to take a chiropractic adjustment and therefore never speak out against sin, debauchery, depravity, and the dens of pornography that inundate their communities. They're at peace with the world, and it matters not that little three to twelve-year-old girls are seduced, abused, and destroyed. Preacher, deacon, church leader, get a glimpse of the abominable pornography currently flooding America via newsstands in the theater. Then get a vision of what you as a soldier in Christ's army should do. I say with the songwriter, onward, Christian soldiers, marching us to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. Christ the royal master leads against the foe. Onward, then you soldiers, see his banner flow. Oh, make a decision today to march against the hosts of hell. This fight for morality should be directed against the purveyors of smut at every level, including television. Today's movies and television presentations emanate an obnoxious odor. Sick minds fill our nation. Is it any wonder we have so many brutal murders? Many of them are but reenactments of former TV shows. With good reason, sane Americans are nauseated. Joseph Papp, founder and producer of the New York Shakespeare Festival, says, TV violence is enough to turn one's stomach. The films being made for TV are horrifying and frightening. The kind of body violence seen on TV each night is an assault on one's senses. Steve Allen, actor and comedian, states, TV has gotten too dirty. Much of television is what I call junk food for the mind. He continues, I don't see any hope in lifting the quality of commercial television. The people who run the networks are perfectly intelligent people, responsible citizens. However, they run junk, junk, to keep the ratings high. The sad thing is that by the time one graduates from high school, 
He has watched 15,000 hours of crash in comparison to 12,000 hours of study in the classroom. Gene Rogers, a Chicago broadcasting executive, recently said, The day of filth has arrived. Every other record I receive has cursing in it. The majority of TV shows have cursing in them. Have we sunk so low that we have sold our children to the dogs in order to make a dollar? Thank God for Gene Rogers. He takes a better stand than the thousands of our ministers who never speak out, who never raise their voices against sin. The situation is so deplorable that even Ingrid Bergman, before her decease, said, I find this skin game nauseating. Love is more than walking around naked, copulating. It's an emotion one should be able to convey without going into the crudest details and the filthiest of language. The results? Among 15-year-olds, one girl out of every four has had intercourse. And 10% of all 13-year-olds have had sex. The culprit is pornography in magazines and movies and on television. We become what we see. How ridiculous in the light of the facts to mourn over the moral problems of our children and the crimes being committed by them and still allow them to receive training by the hour in front of the God with a glass face. The Christians, I say, you that love the Lord, hate evil, Psalm 97, 10. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done to them in secret, Ephesians 5, verses 11 and 12. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, think on these things. Philippians 4, 8. Yes, turn away your eyes from beholding vanity. Psalm 119, 37. Be like David the psalmist who said, I will set no evil thing before mine eyes. Psalm 101, verse 3. And why should you take this stand? Because the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. 1 John 2.17Message number four, America, beware. Americans, beware. Our nation is on the very threshold of total destruction or abject surrender. Oh, you think that God would never allow this to happen to America? The fact of the matter is he may cause it to occur. The average American has no idea that his nation's in danger. However, Never in the annals of our history have we faced the seriousness of the Holocaust presently confronting us. Now, I don't want this to happen any more than you do, because I love America. I believe she is the greatest nation on earth. With all her shortcomings and sins, I believe she is worth living and dying for. I love America for her freedoms, her beauty, her great cities, her quiet countrysides, her incredible conveniences, and her churches. But I fear for my beloved nation, as I would fear for a child riding a tricycle down the Los Angeles freeway. I cannot but tremble for America when I consider the direction in which we're headed. I don't want to tear America down. I want to preserve her. That's why I must sound the alarm. I know what happens when righteousness abdicates and sin ascends the throne. I know what happens when a nation raises a clenched fist toward God, as we've done in the last 20 years. I know what must occur when a nation becomes enamored with multifarious forms of idolatry, sorcery, and immorality. It must fall unless there is a speedy and complete turning to God. Sin destroyed Babylon, Egypt, Assyria, Phoenicia, and the glorious Roman Empire. Read and reread Gibbon's rise and fall of the Roman Empire and realize again and again that every sin inundating our nation is but a repeat of world history. They fell as we will, because every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Judges 21, 25. How sad that America should come to such an inglorious hour when her past is unexcelled in the pages of history. Contrary to what some deists and atheists claim, America's founding fathers were Christians. 
In fact, of the 55 men who framed and signed the Constitution of the United States of America, 30 were outspoken believers, and another 20 were Bible Orthodox Christians. Only five of the total could be considered deists or atheists. In our founding days, Christianity so permeated the land that our leaders spoke freely about their religious convictions. Our first president, George Washington, pulled no punches when he declared, it is impossible to govern the world without God. At this time, an English visitor beholding our religious practices said, Christianity has made them what they are. Yes, these principles of godliness made us what we are, an illustrious nation under the Almighty. That's why I believe that the following verses pertaining to Israel are indeed applicable to America. Deuteronomy 8, verses 7 and 9 state, For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of oil, olive and honey, a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness. Verse 10 adds, when thou hast eaten and art full, then shalt thou bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. There's no doubt about it. Proverbs 14.34 is absolutely correct. Righteousness exalteth a nation. This has been the reason for our prestigious power. But our decline may be at hand because the remainder of the verse declares that sin is a reproach to any people. America has never been in such a state of degradation and hopelessness. She is laden or loaded with iniquity. The pollution inundating our land centers around 12 major sins. One, drunkenness, or culturally identified as alcoholism. Ten million inebriates drink themselves into insensibility on a continual basis, while millions more spend billions on booze annually. Two, drug addiction, which mars and scars another 10 million in our nation. Don't become another John Bellucci. Three, tobacco, which pollutes both lungs and land to the tune of $10 billion per year. Four, gambling, which robs needy millions through government-controlled lotteries and mafia-dominated casinos in the amount of $60 billion each year. Five, prostitution and pimping, which spreads disease and shame to 9 million Americans every 12 months and costs 25 to $100 per trick. Sex, homosexuality, which seeks to arrogantly, egotistically, blatantly, and publicly boast about its perverted membership. In anger, they desire to come out of the closet. Well, the closet's a good place to practice perversion. If it's good enough for the married in the privacy of a room, why should gays receive special privileges to proclaim their perversity? God says it's a shame to even speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Ephesians 5.12 7. Smut peddlers spreading sexual filth via magazine racks and they cover the nation. Their satanically inspired trash is found everywhere including the corner grocery store. Praise God, changes are coming. Christians should rise up in arms, boycott the devil's hangouts loaded with soul-destroying adulterous materials and patronize the shops of decent Americans. Since Jesus said that lust through the eye gate amounts to adultery, Matthew 5, 28, then why patronize soul-damning dealers who bait the young into a life of lustful slavery and eternal hell? Make a decision, then fulfill it. Eight, immoral lepers also plague the nation. As a result, millions are carrying illegitimate babies. Thousands of the victims are 11 to 13 years of age. It appears that high school sex education courses have stimulated rather than educated the young. Sex sin, however, is reaping its reward. Presently, nine million persons with venereal disease have reaped the reward of running sores from eyes, ears, mouth, genitals, and other moisture-producing areas of the body. This says nothing about the 20 million who have herpes, nor of the tens of thousands who already have the AIDS virus in their bodies. It's estimated that there are already one million of those, and it doubles every 10 months. That's why the kiss of the VD carrier is obnoxiously unclean. Do not get tricked or trapped. The shame is not worth the brief encounter. Beware, young man and young lady. Beware, mother and father. Your fling 
may sting. For they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. Job 8, 4. Number 9. And, oh, this is sad. Abortion. The murder of unwanted babies is also affecting one and a half million women annually. 4,000 a day! 4,000 daily murdered! Butchered! These so-called cultured but barbaric sinners think nothing of having their little bundles from God hacked to pieces and flushed. Never mind that God says thou shalt not kill, Exodus 20, 13. These sinners have taken the matter into their own hands, forgetting that God holds the final trump card at Judgment Day. Revelation 20, verses 11 to 15. Ten mercy killers are also on the ascendancy in America. They are progressive abortionists who become hardened to killing and now wish to include the mommies and daddies along with the babies. The honor thy father and mother of God's commandments, Exodus 20, 12, interferes with their fun. The responsibility is too great, so the old folks must go. Such sick children must be related to Adolf Hitler. Am I proclaiming fairy tales, or does such thinking and planning exist? You be the judge. Doctors Watson and Crick, the famous Nobel Prize-winning discoverers of the DNA molecule, have both recommended such a course. Dr. Crick advocates compulsory death for all at age 80. Presently, pro-abortionists who already kill one and a half million babies annually in America are also involved in brainwashing programs for euthanasia or mercy killing. They cry, why let your poor mother or grandfather die in misery? Surely your compassionate nature should make death with dignity a consideration. Friend, this is the ultimate of a depraved society created by humans who have decided to play God. But, God shall bring every work into judgment, Ecclesiastes 12, 14. Number 11, murders also, along with abortionists and death with dignity advocates, stalk the country. 50,000 are savagely slaughtered within our nation annually. These human animals who stalk, torture, brutalize, and then slaughter their victims use hatchets, knives, and guns. They then decapitate or behead and dismember the victims and finally burn or bury the remains. My files are flooded with such atrocities. Number 12, robbers and looters also rear their ugly faces, destroying, plundering, and pillaging another man's lifetime accumulations. They call it fair play because of their many shortages. However, most of them are tired like the Sheik of Araby and drive limousines as they mourn about their shortages. I believe that the decadent film fair in theaters and on television screens has brought about most of the rottenness described in today's message. And some of you Christians are always talking about going to the movies and there's nothing wrong with it. There's never been such an area of filthiness in the movie. The cursing of God, the violence, the lewd and nude scenes, and the debauchery that goes with it. Nothing mind-stimulating. The world sometimes has more sense than some of our church members. Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times says, recent violent acts in our city have been attributed to the inspiration provided by movies. His final lament is, God save the kids of this generation from the dreams they are storing away in their minds through the movies. Thank you, Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. Friend, where do you stand? There's a choice to be made. It's either revival or ruin. Presently, nuclear bombs are being prepared at breakneck speed and may soon fall as a winter blizzard. I do not know if there's any hope among nations, but I do know that you personally may experience freedom from the enslavement of sin, 
For if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I know scores of people whom I've met personally. I've seen them come down the aisles. I've read their letters as they bow their heads by television sets and by radio receivers who said, I was a drug addict. I was an alcoholic. I was steeped in sexual impurity. I was a homosexual. I was a prostitute. And they go on and on. And they came to Jesus and were set free because if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I love 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Happened to me. Jesus Christ is coming soon. Prepare to meet him now by acting upon John 1 12. You want to be ready? But as many as received him, to them give you power to become the sons of God. After message one, drugs, I had prayer where I ask you to receive Christ and rather than have you turn back, let's do it one more time. God loves you. He wants to save you. And if you'll come right now to the foot of the cross and see Christ hanging there for you, because Christ died for our sins, say, Lord, I lay my sins on you. Everyone that was mentioned in this message, my personal sin, was, which was not mentioned, but for which I feel great guilt now. I bring to you. I lay it on you, Jesus. I ask that your blood cleanse me and wash me and take away every stain of sin. So Jesus, come into my heart now. Save me. I receive you as my own in Jesus' name. If you're a believer and you've walked afar off, come home. Pray this prayer, Lord, I've wandered away. Like the prodigal, I want to come home. Your word says, the father went out to meet the prodigal with open arms. And your word continues to tell me that your arms are outstretched in love for me. I come back. I renew my life. I will be different. Holy Spirit, fill me. May victory be mine this day as I allow you to fill my life and as I spend time in the Holy Word of God, which can keep me from sin. So here is my life, my all, accept it, accept me, in Jesus' name, amen.